recording. So each of you will be asked just to agree to that. And we'll jump in. We'll let people join us as they can. To Kim's point, it is the Friday before a long weekend. So I don't know about you, but I'm looking at this group and I'm thinking, this is dedication right here. This is dedication. This is commitment coming out and joining us today. So we really, on behalf of Kim at the PIN Network and myself, Kurt Hammond, the Chief Learning Officer at foursimplewords.ca, we are grateful for your time and really appreciate you coming out today. Um, and we are excited about celebrating Non-For-Profit Appreciation Week. So, I mean, that's, that was the whole goal of when Kim and I started this literally three and a half weeks ago was what could we do and this came together and it was could we draw on our network of smart people and pick their brains and we have just been so blessed to have smart people like Aaron and Linda join us for the week and I'll formally introduce our guests and we'll jump into those conversations um, shortly. A reminder of some of the things we've covered off this week. Monday we talked to Jim Moss from YMCA uh, Workwell and he helped us think about this conversation around staff burnout and work-life balance. On Tuesday, we talked with the great Kathy Taylor from the ONN, Ontario Not-for-Profit Network. And we were talking about this new normal that we're all having to deal with as a sector. On Wednesday, Kim was joined by Jane, Heather, and Kareen. And we were talking about how volunteerism is changing. And we need to change with it to keep engaged um, with individuals who want to be involved in our sector. Yesterday, Sarah and Olga really pushed and challenged us to uh, embrace our fears around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, you know, my big takeaway from that was just, just do it. Like, let's just start leaning. No, not leaning in. And for those of you that joined us yesterday, I've got some language to be checking in on. But start starting the work and acknowledging that we're never going to be perfect and ready to start. So that was a really good takeaway and conversation there. I hope you enjoy that as well. And today we're rethinking governance, right? Which is an exciting, yeah, and I said it, governance is exciting. I know Aaron and Linda are gonna agree <laughs> with that. Um, good governance impacts our organizations, it impacts our communities, and it is a honor to serve as a director of an organization. So today we're thinking about how we can reimagine what good governance looks like. And I know that uh, our speakers are gonna have some real great insights for us on how we can maybe be pushing some thresholds in our organization. Before we go any further, our land acknowledgement and a reminder that we are coming together from across the province today and no matter where you're sitting, no matter where your screen is, there were peoples, cultures and traditions on these very lands long before any of us were. And these wise peoples did their best to help us to teach us how to steward our land, our water, and our air. Now, unfortunately, we have done a terrible job at listening to their wisdom and our environment is now paying that price. Even worse, and in fact, it is much worse, we have yet to fully acknowledge that our community is literally built on top of theirs. And we can no longer turn away from the economic, social, and emotional damage that we have done to generations of families across this country. And I myself am just starting to come to terms with the word settler and what that means and what my own individual role in writing relations with our Indigenous sisters and brothers is. And so I don't have any answers on that today. What I do want to remind us, though, is that we have been handed a gift through our land. And we've also been handed a gift of the values of community, of looking out for one another, of leadership. And we need to remind ourselves, we must remind ourselves, that those are, in fact, Indigenous values that we are carrying on today. So that's our gift. The gift and responsibility we have with those, um, with those values is to remind those leaders that are gonna follow us that they are indeed part of a continuum of community that started with our indigenous cultures. So let's take a moment to be reflectful and grateful for the land we're on and here in Ontario and in Canada, we have to remember that truth must come before reconciliation. So with that, I want to again celebrate and acknowledge that we're excited about Not-for-Profit Appreciation Week. We've been sharing a few little, um, some information and some data around the not-for-profit sector this week. And because we're talking about governance and directors, uh, went, where else would I go for information but to our good friends at the Ontario Not-for-Profit Network and pull out a few facts that I actually didn't know. I'm, I've learned a lot this week and I've, <laughs> um, yeah, I've got a lot to learn, including 
um, the minimum number of directors a not-for-profit can have. Anyone want to guess? You can do it on one hand, so you can put up your hand if you want to guess on this one. Anyone want to jump? The minimum number of directors a not-for-profit in Ontario can have. It's three. So three, we all need, yeah, Vanessa knew that one. All right, excellent. And what's the maximum length? Is there a maximum? Yes, what is the maximum length of term that a director can serve? What is the maximum length of term? How many years can a director serve at a maximum? That's four. However, there's no maximum of the number of times you can be reelected. So I thought that was interesting too. And here's the big one. And again, this is a very much in gratitude to our friends at ONN. Um, since November of 2021, so just like months ago, the rules and regulations that guide what it means to be a director in Ontario are now fall under the Not-for-Profit Corporations Act. And it was started in 2010, and it was formally passed just last year. So a lot of hard work went into that. I see Erin uh, nodding her head on that one. I know that her team at ONN has done a lot of work in that. So Erin, thanks for all your leadership in helping that act get passed. And I think there's gonna be some implications for us as not-for-profit leaders. Before we jump in and I formally introduce our speakers, just a quick reminder on some of our forceful words learnings that we've had this week. And again, I feel really blessed to be able to share that with you. On Monday, um, we chatted about why I think servant leadership that, um, is no longer, is well, quite frankly, servant leadership is an outdated model that no longer serves the needs of our communities. And I'm suggesting it be replaced by service leadership. Servant leadership, service leadership puts us in partnership and equity with one another. On Tuesday, we talked about the four simple words. It's not about me. And how they can simplify your life, clean your mind, and amplify your impact. On Wednesday, on Wednesday we chatted about the three steps towards service leadership, which is this incredibly uh, aware and honest sense of self-awareness. Number two was then I get to actively look for gaps and see how I could fit in. And three, most importantly then, was building transparent relationships where I'm constantly checking in back, back in with the individual organization I'm serving around the value that I'm adding and making sure I'm still adding that value. Yesterday, I reminded us that everyone deserves the joy and respect that service brings. And again, that comes back to this equity piece. I, in my heart of hearts, believe that the more we serve, the better people we are. Which leads us to today, which is a quick call to action. And I'm officially on my soapbox, so, uh, so I'll acknowledge that. And I appreciate your time here. And this is an idea that I'm planting. Uh, I've been fertilizing and watering, and now I am ready to see a full on forest grow from, because we need to individually and organizationally have the courage to move beyond the damning and oversimplified winner take all metric that so much of our world is based on. I just firmly believe that not only is it unhealthy, but it's destructive and counterintuitive to the good work we want to do. And I'm going to be bold and say, I'm not impressed by people that can make a lot of money. Because quite frankly, it's easy. You take a good idea, you build a strategy around it, you give smart people the resources they need to execute, and then you get out of their way. There's no real rocket science there. Where the rocket science truly lies, and yes, there's irony in my reference there, is how we can build sustainable systems that don't leave others behind. And if we're really gonna lean into the economic, social and environmental change that we have to make, and we have to be making that change, it can't be in isolation, it can't be short term, nor, and I'm, this, is, this is where I'm sticking my neck out here, nor do I think it's gonna happen without being in service to the right thing. And I think that's my big takeaway and my big question for all of us today is having that honest, that courageous conversation with ourselves and our organizations about being clear, what am I really in service to? And you immediately have an answer to that for many, for many of the things that we do. But if we dig a bit deeper and we scratch a bit on that, what am I really in service to? I think we might get some humbling and perhaps um, not so positive answers. And that's, I think, where we as leaders can be leaning in. I know I'm speaking to the choir on this one, um, and I want to leave us today with again a thank. So I want to thank you again for the chance to be sharing and thinking through this idea of service leadership with me. 
And I, my big takeaway to us all is that the more we embrace the concept of serving others, the more real and impactful change we can be making. Again, I'll remind you that we can, you can learn more about that at forcefulwords.ca. And one very blatant commercial plug, I now have an assessment tool ready for teams to talk about and explore this idea of service leadership. Kim and her team have done it. It doesn't suck. And I would love to share that with your team. So if you're, learning, if you're interested in learning more, forcefulwords.ca. All right, 1212, right on track there. Um, let's move into our conversation today. And, you know, let's be clear, there's two things we don't talk about in the not-for-profit sector. Number one is Bruno. And number two is what good governance actually looks like. I thought I'd get some more jokes of the Bruno piece. No, I thought that was pretty clever. All right, no, it's Friday, it's fine, I'll take it. If you haven't seen Encanto yet, you need to make sure you watch that movie, it's really well done. Seriously though, there, you know, we, as a sector, we talk, we, we know and we rely on this idea of good governance, but I don't think we have enough conversations around what that really looks like, especially after the two years that we've been through. And our good friends at the Ontario Not-for-Profit Network have been leaning into this conversation for a while now, thinking about how they can, we can help us redesign governance to stay relevant in our shifting and complex world. And Aaron and Linda are joining us today to share some of their learnings from their project called Reimagining Governance and gonna help us explore some of the ideas and maybe pathways we can be taking uh, for each of our organizations. I mean, and boldly, and I think this is Aaron's language here. So thanks for this, Aaron. We're really talking about equity, power, and the future of our not-for-profit sector, which I think is really bold conversation. So I'm excited for that. So let me introduce Aaron and Linda, and then we're gonna jump right in. Aaron King is a facilitator, storyteller, and dreamer, I love that, living in Toronto. For over a decade, Aaron has been examining the relationship between people, place, and power through her studies, her profession, and her creative projects. She's the founder of Stories of Ours, a grassroots project which aims to deepen community, invite solidarity, and challenge dominant narratives through intentional acts of storytelling and art. As a convener at heart, she thrives in spaces of community building and mutuality. Erin's work lies at the intersections of anti-oppressive pedagogy, community collaborations, and creative arts. Erin, so nice to have you here, thank you. Linda Mo Molenhauer, sorry, sorry, one night trip up on that. Molenhauer is chair of Ignite NPS, a foundation committed to igniting new ways of working in the not-for-profit sector. She is currently co-lead of Reimagining Governance in collaboration with the not-for-profit network. Linda led a consulting practice for over 20 years with funders and not-for-profit organizations. In collaboration with others, she has published resources such as Trends and Forces Reshaping Not-for-Profit Organizations, Board Oversight of Not-for-Profit Collaborations, Benchmarks of Excellence for the Voluntary Sector, and Collaboration Coach. Prior to her consulting practice, she was CEO of Imagine Canada, and she has a master's degree in communications from Boston's University, a fellow communicator. Yes, we walk amongst you, ladies and gentlemen, we walk amongst you. How about a round of applause and welcome to Aaron and Linda for joining us today. Aaron and Linda, thanks so much for being here today. What a gift. Thank you. Thanks so much for convening this. So let's jump in. I know you've got a lot to share. We want to hear more about uh, reimagining governance. Let's start there. What do we mean when we say reimagining governance? It sounds it sounds big. Tell us what you're what you're thinking about there. Yeah, um, maybe I'll start off, Linda, and then um, you can sort of fill in the the blanks here. Um, but really, reimagining governance is about provoking a shift in how we think about and therefore how we do governance work. Uh, so governance is, you know, really about who is making decisions, how those decisions are made, and who is ultimately accountable for those decisions. Uh, and yet, a lot of the time when we have conversations about governance, they're really centered on um, one structure of governance, uh, the board, mm -hmm. uh, a very critical, important part. But uh, a lot of our work has really been about illuminating the more complex system that governance really is and trying to um, kind of 
unpack it so that it can be put back together in ways that really align with the organization's unique circumstances. We know that nonprofits are so diverse, uh, the communities that they serve, the, um, the internal and external factors that, that they navigate. Uh, and so approaching governance with this idea that there's you know, one or two models that you can choose from and then squish into uh, doesn't um, align and doesn't really set people up set organizations up for success. Uh, Linda, it would be great maybe if you can kind of share some of the inspiration that went into why Reimagine. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, Kurt, you start by saying um, that a, a focus on what is good governance. And ha having been um, involved in the sector for a very long time, uh, I've been involved in lots and lots of conversations about what does good governance look like over decades and the, the, the conversations kind of are the same. Uh, I haven't changed fundamentally. Sure. Um, and so early on and why we, we even introduced the word reimagine is we realized that we've been spending a whole lot of time um, fixing and talking about symptoms. And um, that maybe what's really needed is to step back and, and think about what are some of the assumptions that our, our notions of governance rest on? And maybe we need to challenge those mm -hmm. and really think about the fundamental design of go governance, the construct of governance. Um, because what's the point of continuing to talk about what good governance is, which we could all name and list a really good chair, really, you know, uh, all the right competencies and diversity. If we keep not being able to, um, that 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 becomes very difficult to do. So I think that that's an interesting part of what we're trying to do with reimagining. The other is um, to the fundamental notion that the world has really really shifted, and um, and becomes increasingly more complex, more fluid. Um, more um, uh, dynamic. Mm -hmm. And our organizations in the not-for-profit sector are actually aligning themselves with that. And you're seeing all kinds of stories about that taking place. But we actually, when we look at governance, the way governance is done, it's kind of stuck. Um, and so part of what we're trying to do is um, kickstart some conversations um, that, that uh, starts to look at how can we align the way we do governance with the world, uh, sort of our operating environment that it lives in. Interesting. I've got a lot, I, I'm gonna start our conversation with a few questions. By all means, please jump into the chat. So I should have said that earlier um, and share any questions you have with your, um, with our, for our guests and we'll be sure to incorporate those. So Linda, I wanna build on something you said there. Why is this difficult? Why is it difficult to define good governance? Um, I'm not suggesting that it's difficult to define good governance, mm -hmm. but the way we define what is good about governance rests on a lot of different assumptions. Um, okay. So we're trying to say, all right, so if, if these are the assumptions uh, that we make, here's what good governance looks like. What if we shift those assumptions? I get it. Okay, right. Yeah, maybe if I could jump in, um, one of the ways that we've been exploring how to reframe those questions is really by thinking, okay, well, if governance was defined as the board is the home of governance, what would that look like? And if you start thinking about the characteristics, if the board is the home of governance, it starts to think about, okay, well, it's the locus of control. Everything starts and ends there. Um, it looks like the, the board as um, being, um, the approval body or, or the place where all governance work takes place. And if we reframe that to how can the board act as the host of governance and start thinking about governance work as the broad um, array of decisions, functions that go on in an organization, it becomes clear that actually there are more people who really shape and influence how governance work is done, right? Going back to governance is how we make decisions, who makes those decisions, who 
is accountable. And so the ED, the CEO, senior staff, in certain circumstances, perhaps partners or funders or other outside uh, collaborators are also influencing the direction or the strategic um, goals of the organization. But that's governance work. And so really thinking about what is shaping and influencing uh, governance from those many different um, places in the ecosystem, uh, it really starts to shift the kinds of questions that organizations can be asking themselves um, and really start to dig into what people mean when they say things like uh, stewardship. Does that look like direct and control or does that look like enable and um, you know allow fluidity? So depending on um, the mindsets, the, the culture, the experiences, the professions, mm. all of those things that people bring into the governance space, uh, those perceptions of what governance work is and what is good will, will differ. And so unless we name them and talk about them and really be intentional about understanding how that impacts how we're making decisions, uh, that can really have such profound effect on how governance work is carried out. So it sounds like we're democratizing this a little bit. Is that, is that an appropriate word to use here? It's, oh, sorry, go ahead, Linda. <laughs> and paint, so and the, where I'm going with that is paint a picture for me a little bit of, and I, um, I understand you've, you've been hosting some labs and doing some research and some thinking. So drill down for us a bit on what this looks like or what this could look like, or maybe what some of these assumptions are. Take us down another level in terms of what we're, what, some examples maybe you can point to us for us um I, we're we're actually not uh, proposing what governance should look like um we're because we think one of the problems we've gotten into in the sector is um that models have been proposed and then organizations find a model and then often just try to squish themselves into it mm. um we come at from a different point of view which is to say, we're not gonna give you a model. What we're going to do is give you a framework that will allow you to design your governance based on your unique circumstances. And in that process of designing and thinking about what your governance should look like, we're going to come at it um, not, not from um, assumptions that sort of no longer make sense or, or, or might be soft ground, but get you um, to start to reflect in a different way mm. on, on mm. that. So we're intentionally not creating, saying this is what your government should look like. But if I can share an example of um, uh, not something we said should happen, but through sort of this um, process of naming and reflecting, uh, within a organization's team, governance team. Um, one example would be really uh, for maybe the first time or for the first time as a group kind of saying, um, you know, the way that we actually engage our stakeholders, uh, the structure that we use to engage our stakeholders, whether it's this committee and advisory is actually decades old. And we haven't changed that structure of how we're engaging with our stakeholders, with our communities. But over the past few years, perhaps the landscape has changed so much, right? The, the nature of their work has changed or the communities that they are working with and, and serving has shifted. And so aligning um, that change with letting go of this notion that we have to keep this structure in place because we have it and it works and you know it worked 40 years ago so and it's there's no burning issue with it now so why why should we change it but shifting that to well what could be possible if we did change it right and if we okay. did mm -hmm. create some more agile processes maybe that um gather people around a specific issue or a specific piece of governance work that needs to happen and being more nimble with our structures, um, engaging people in a more human way, as opposed to keeping this structure that has been placed for a while because it, you know, it works and there's nothing um, on fire with it. And so I think part of it as well is this aspirational mindset of what could be possible if we did create new ways of working, even if uh, what we have in place might seem like it's okay right now. Sure. So 
can I just really be vulnerable for a second and say, this is scaring the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and I share that and I, and I half joking because I, Aaron and Linda were very gracious and let me sit down one of these sessions they, they ran in the fall. And that was my reaction back then as well. So it sounds like we're asking for, uh, it's a courageous conversation that we're asking organizations to have. Can you help frame up what that conversation might be a little bit for us? Like, what is the, where do we, if we want to reimagine governance, where do we start some of those conversations? Is that a, tell us, tell us what that journey might look like. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And of course, with anything, it'll vary across organization, but there are a couple starting points. I think the first is really just demystifying and leveling this notion of reimagination, of innovation. What we're talking about here is simply, you know, um, coming up with new ways of thinking and, and and doing that we can start to apply that don't necessarily mean you know all the drastic changes in in one quarter um but could be something as if we shifted the question for example from you know how do we diversify our board and just simply shifted that to how do we get more diversity in our governance decision making like just decentering the board from that question oh i see that yeah, is see. innovative thinking right um, and, and, and feels more accessible. I think one of the challenges is that, you know, the whole idea of reimagination of innovation can seem like, um, a cliff to <laughs> climb with no gear. Right. Um, uh, so that's one piece. And the second, and, and there's more, I'm sure Linda can jump in, but one that's really resonated has been not only normalizing the messiness and fear and discomfort that can come with this kind of change work, but almost welcoming it as a sign that you are doing that change work and and seeing it in a light of oh this is an indicator that i'm committing that i'm being brave um that you know that we are not just um sort of riding a wave of inertia uh seeing that discomfort um as a, as a sign and it's so much easier to to say than to practice but i think that's one of the key learnings that we've really been coming out of this with is um is to really invite that and what that looks like in teams is you know leaders making the space to say i am vulnerable and i am not you know this is also uncomfortable for me but hey let's dive in together or um you know leaders and by leaders i just mean like could be the ed it could be a champion on the board it could be a senior staff who's kind of like you know why don't we have this conversation um and just opening that space to to have that conversation um i think yeah linda anything to add yeah i would say um most of our conversations around governance focus on how we're kind of lifting it up without getting academic hopefully um to why um, and and what and so even in that as we come back out to the sector with um, some some of our learnings we're we're, we're cre creating a, a microsite and the idea in the microsite is to be able to have a space uh, where people can come in and we give them some tools that prompt innovation again we're not saying here's what you should be doing because we're not giving hows but we're letting people uh, form their own house by giving them the kinds of questions uh, and prompts, stories um, that might um, take them to that place. Well, thank, thanks for, for that. And thanks for that context. That's really helpful. A couple of comments, one from Amy. <clears throat> she says, a sage piece of advice I was given was that the prize you get for doing this work is the mess you make. I think that, that's, uh, that's some good stuff. <laughs> That's some great stuff in there, Amy. And then Riva is commenting, it sounds like this is about decentralizing power, which can be threatening to some. I wonder if you can reflect on that. Maybe that comes back to my fear piece a little bit. Well, I, I think that the key here too is we, we're we not proponents of a particular model. In other words, we're not reimagining governance isn't coming out and saying you should decentralize your governance and this is what it might look like. But we are uh, asking people questions um, and, and prompting people to sort of think of the full expanse of their the, the ecosystem their governance sits in. And, and so a lot of the time when we talk about governance, 
we talk about boards and it's quite linear. Boards committees, boards processes, boards this, boards relationship with the CEO. And, and we're saying actually governance is an ecosystem. And mm. there are all kinds of influencers in that, both being shaped by how you do governance and how you do governance is then shaping that. And they may be external kind of influencers. They might be internal influencers like your own governance culture, which may or may not be intentional. So um, that, so, so we're not sort of taking, you should have a very decentralized kind of governance, but we are saying governance sits in an ecosystem. And that's actually not surprising to everyone because we're not, as Aaron said a little bit ago, we're not, we're not making up something new. We're simply uh, shining a light on the actual reality uh, that takes place in governance. So, it's a fascinating concept, isn't it? And again, jumping with your questions in the chat, everyone, uh, this idea that governance is an ecosystem. Can you we, can we drill down on that a bit? And we've chatted a bit about that, but maybe can get a little more practical around what that can look like for us. Help us, like, and I, I we've got a range of organizations in terms of size here, and I, um, I'm wondering, is the ecosystem going to look? It'll look different organization to organization. Does it also look different, perhaps the size of the organization? Mm -hmm. I would say that those are definitely um, factors that would impact uh, an organization. So maybe I'll start off with, um, if we start from just talking about governance design, as we mentioned, so how governance is put together, that includes things like um, your governance structures, boards, committees, any kind of structures you put in place, processes, uh, you, the people, and the culture. And we see these sort of four aspects of governance design as you know, they're very interconnected, they influence each other. You can't just sort of change one or work on one without it impacting one or the rest of those. Um, we've been kind of referring to them as enablers of governance. These are the things you put in mm. place to do the, the work of, of governance. Um, so if we start from sort of thinking, okay, there's the design of an organization's governance. Uh, there's also a, a number of sort of influencing factors on that, such as how the organization organization um, sees the role of governance in that organization. This is going to vary, um, even though the ultimate goal of governance will remain pretty consistent, which is that your your the goal of governance is to enable uh, positive community impact and for the organization to achieve its purpose. Um, but that role that is going to be fluid in uh, in organizations, as well as things like their, you know, um, binding requirements under uh, under right. law and, and, and yeah, yeah. like that. And then there's the sort of uh, internal um, influencers, which are things like the organization size, life cycle, capacity, um, history, uh, partners, how it's funded, all of those sort of factors that influence what their governance design looks like. And then there's the external factors of all of the trends and forces that are out there in the sector and how those are impacting how governance work is done. Um, so that's sort of the, I might have missed a couple pieces actually, Linda, I don't know if you want to jump in, but those are some of the pieces of that ecosystem that we're talking about. Mm, okay, Linda, yeah. Uh, the, the only, um, you know, and we have a map that's on the website site that you can look at because it's got all the components and a framework which describes each of the pieces. The other interesting part of this is we've run into organizations um, where they will say the board does governance, the ED does not do governance, the ED does not make governance decisions, doesn't do governance, it supports the board's work in governance. And that is an assumption we're sort of pushing back a little bit and, and sort of getting people to reflect on because in fact, EDs um, are, 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 you know, the, if, even if we're talking about best practice here or good governance, we know a partnership between the ED and the board is, is critical to success, but also that ED is making all kinds of strategic decisions and thinking about what the direction is. And for years, we've seen in some instances, or I have, where ED spend an, a huge amount of time basically doing the work of governance, but having the board feel they're doing governance. And so it's things like, 
like that, that we just want to name that it is in this ecosystem of influencers and decision making. It already is by nature broad. Interesting. Um, I think for our visual learners, let me help us see this. Kim, could you uh, let Erin share her screen for a second? Because Erin, I think you've got a map there. You put it in the chat, but maybe you could pull that up for us and you could share that with us and just walk us through. Again, I'm, the, I'm a visual learner, so uh, hopefully uh, this will help out. Whoa, yes, yes, right, 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 right. So walk us through this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I mean, just as a just as a, a preface as well, we ourselves are you know in the waters of innovation and and change. So we're actually in the process of iterating even further on this. But um, what we've aimed to do with this version of the map is first to kind of uh, we've been saying deconstruct governance into these sort of various um, things that we just talked about. So I spoke to the goal, the role, the fixed requirements. There's those influencers this uh, space that we've referred to as the design playground, because this is the space that organizations actually have to play with new ways of working in this space of culture, structures, people, and processes, um, and to sort of show that everything is uh, very much connected um, and not um, a linear, as, as Linda said, or necessarily top-down um, uh, view of the system, but is rather um, made up of all these different things. And uh, if we are able to, to share this with folks, you know, it is an interactive map where you can sort of click and read through. Um, these are the sort of uh, functions around governance that we've tried to identify and really lift up from those board roles and, re and responsibilities we're so familiar mm. with hearing um, and kind of walks you through sort of the different uh, components of the map. Yeah. Excellent. Um, Again, welcome your questions in the um, in the chat. Thanks for uh, thanks for walking us through that, Aaron. That's really helpful. I'm wondering, help us understand, and maybe this is a, an obvious question. We perhaps should have started here, but to why why would my organization, which is already stressed, I mean, this week has just been all about all the additional stressors and workload that I have. What's the paint? What's the picture we're painting for organizations to? take time and effort and think about reimagining governance. What are some of the, the benefits that we can pull away from this? Mm -hmm. it's, it's such a good question, especially knowing um, all the different kinds of stressors that are impacting the sector and its leaders, for sure. Um, I would say one of the biggest drivers, uh, especially for the organizations who worked with us in our learning labs uh, in preparation for our, uh, our public lab, um, is a, a desire to do the work now to actually reduce some of those stressors for the future, right? Mm -hmm. If you take the time to um, do this work, and it might not, as I said, happen quickly, it might, you know, you need to invest a little bit of time to, to align with your uh, capacities. But if you were to do this now, what could be possible? you know, three years down the road, five years down the road, if some of the pre the pressures on the organization are, um, you know, ar around misalignment, right, or about the decisions that are being made are actually causing uh, stress on, on the staff, like, the, there, it's so interconnected and governance is one of those foundations of, of what enables us to do our, our work in the sector. And so that's sort of that big picture why. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's hard to keep that big picture why in mind when you're facing um, challenges or immediate crises. Right. And what, one of the things um, with reimagining governance is, is reflecting on if you're ready for change. And if you're not in a space to commit to deep change, what, again, are those small shifts that you can take, those little shifts in the questions that you're asking, or whenever a decision comes up, is there one or two questions that you're asking about why, or you know, how does this align, or et cetera. Um, those things can really have an immediate impact on the work that you're doing, and therefore some of the stresses that you might be facing um, in, in in our work. So uh, Linda, so there's a yeah, lot more. And yeah. You're sort of saying this, but I think a lot of boards are feeling and, and EDs and CEOs are feeling the burden of the yes. complexity of governance work. So we, we keep, it, it's back to that earlier point about the kind of how you're framing the questions. So 
people, organizations just keep trying to get those competencies, but year after year might not be able to get the competencies. So we're saying, let's reframe the question. Is there a way to get those competencies that don't all have to sit and be sort of uh, within the 12 people sitting around the boardroom table? So I think that that would be a good example. But as Aaron said, the bottom line is we're the people who are going to be attracted to our conversations are early adapters. Right. We're our goal when we um, when this um, new microsite uh, comes out in in the spring, um, which is a reimagining governance lab, is um, to really um, attract what we know. Uh, and intentionally we'll try to attract some of those people who actually want to in innovate because we think what will really start to make a change in the sector is because we start generating stories of it being done differently. And so we need those early adapters to start creating those stories. We'll mm -hmm. be sharing those stories. And, you know, just imagine if, you know, we had 25 stories about some really interesting innovations started to take place. So the people who may not be those more braver people who are out in front start saying, I didn't know you could do that. That's really interesting. Let's explore that. So um, our goal isn't to get sort of market share in terms of organizations out okay. there. It's yep. to get those, uh, uh, those, those people who ha ha are already propelled towards finding innovation. So is, um, well, uh, let me start here. Communicator to communicator, Linda, and I, because it's such an important lens to put on this, right? How do we start these conversations internally? I see, I see a, a number of board chairs and leaders on our call today. What advice do you have for them to maybe get that flywheel going around this internal conversation around starting something like this? And then, to, second to that, how then, do we take that conversation externally to outside the organization? So I'm just wondering, if you, like, how do we start telling the story of our process? Maybe that's the question. Well, maybe I'll, I'll kick off and then hand it over to Aaron. But I, I think that that's what we hope will happen with the uh, micro, our, our reimagining governance lab, that um, it, it, it will be that place and, and there'll be different parts uh, and components because different people are going to come in to the idea of um, finding better ways to do governance for different different reasons. So we want to create a set, we're creating a set of tools, a set of processes, a sort of that somebody can come in wherever they're at and they may be at uh, a notion that we, we're at an important um, uh, shifting point in our organization. We've just had a, we, we shifted in life cycle. It's a good time. Think about how we're doing governance. They may come in with a problem that we, we need to engage and have more voices in the way that governance is done. They may enter with that. So we're not proposing there's a way to come into it. Um, and it may come from the ED or CEO, or it may come from a board member. Um, and, and then what we're going to hopefully be providing people are some things that will allow them to take that back into the organization. I mean, I think a, a, a simple entryway question can simply just be, how do we define governance? Mm -hmm. Right, And, and yeah. just see what answers come up um, from the staff, from, from the board, from the ED. Uh, and I'm sure that not, uh, you know, it's not going to be 100% the same across the board. So even starting from that point of how do we as an organization really define governance um, can be a really great entryway. Again, I encourage you to drop um, your questions into the chat. I see Erin's linked, uh, put a link in there for us to her, their uh, newsletter. So I encourage you to sign up for that and get updates on when the lab will be launching. Um, 15 minutes left, this is great. I'm wondering, how do we, and I wanna come back to that wicked question that we were chatting about before we, we got together. And Aaron, this comes back to your language, I think around power and dynamics. You know, what, 
as we think about building more equity into our organizations, into our governance structures, into our systems, this probably is a straight line back to our to the DE and I conversation we had yesterday. Um, how can this reimagining governance help us along with those conversations and really thinking about some systemic change as well? I wonder when I, we chat about that for a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think in the question of, of equity and collective liberation and, and, and justice and all of these sort of um, futures that we're imagining, one of those ways um, I think uh, can be through reimagining how our governance is done and how we conceive of governance and, um, you know, how can we trace our conceptions of governance to um, its roots uh, in, in colonial systems. And not to say that, you know, we uh, are asking every single organization to um, necessarily uh, change everything in order to pursue that. But if we are going to be serious about uh, pursuing equity, then it really does um, invite mm -hmm. us to question how we define things, how we share uh, share that power. Um, I often refer to Cindy Suarez's work around power and, and complex power dynamics. And she puts forward that one of the only places where as individuals, we really have the power to change existing power dynamics is through our interactions with people. And governance is made of interactions with people, right? And so mm -hmm. I think that is the sort of root connection that I see there. Some of the, um, I, I did see one question ask, uh, asking about some examples. We mm -hmm. have um, just uh, wrapped up um, uh, seven learning labs. And the idea of the learning labs was to um, take some of our processes and tools and, and co-create with an organization through the process. A lot of learnings. One of the key is there is no nice linear process that <laughs> they can adapt, uh, right. adopt. Um, but I think that um, they surfaced a number of interesting innovations. Um, one that sort of started to look at the structures that they'd had in place for decades um, that was feeding into, it was their stakeholder engagement in, dis, in governance decision-making. And they kind of stepped back through the process and they went, wait a minute, is that the, the that structure still makes sense given the diversity of the kind of stakeholders we have? And maybe what we need to do is step back and sort of think about what are those governance decisions where input and and shared decision making is going to uh, have some real value, and then design to a, a much more agile way of, of doing this. So they actually are shifting away from this decades old structure um, to something that is much more fluid and agile. Uh, that's a good example of, of some. Another one of our organizations, <laughs> Theirs is a much more transformative process that they're actually going through. And they started with that question that Aaron raised at the very beginning. What do we mean by stewardship? Who is stewarding on behalf of whom? Mm. And, um, and it was from that kind of fairly uh, philosophical principle. All right, yeah, yeah. They then, so we're, we started to surface some interesting uh, stories, I think, in innovation. This is fascinating. I, I see there's some real benefits to this. I'm wondering how do we, and we're definitely, I think, thinking about and kind of, you know, we're all thinking like early adopters in this conversation. I'm wondering what advice, and, and, there's, and that's great, right? I, I really want to celebrate that. What advice do we have or insights can we share for those people who are going to be sitting on the edges for a little while watching this, but want to and know to the, you know, know the power of, of governance and how it can be a tool for, for change. For, for those that are maybe want to be watching a bit longer, what practical advice can we offer them as they think about governance before they maybe jump into some, like a very philosophical question, like who is stewarding who, what, for whom? Like, I love that question. Time and effort involved there. Before we get to that, what are some, what are some advice we can offer organizations that just want to be a little more 
a little more governance curious. I love that notion of being governance curious. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to just think about that question for a second. Maybe, um, maybe one could just be, I think one of the golden threads through so many of our conversations and learnings has been just around this notion of intentionality, you know, mm -hmm. um, whether it's even just thinking about like our culture, is it intentional or is it driven by our personalities that are around the table at the time or um, is, is how we make decisions oh. intentional? Um, so this notion of intentionality, even if you have not yet sort of embarked on a, a change journey or, or anything like that, um, as you're doing your, your ongoing work, um, are there opportunities to invite more intentionality in your existing work without changing anything, like invite that intentionality? I think that that opens a lot of doors for um, revealing assumptions that, that could be just identified and named for later, right? Um, uh, or, or just, you know, oh, we, we usually, when this kind of decision comes up, we have a, a check, 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 and, and it's done. Maybe we want to revisit that. So I think looking for those spaces to invite some intentionality in your existing work. And, and I would add just um, to, to um, stepping back and sort of challenging things and asking more why questions, less how questions. And a good example mm. of an organization simply saying, wow, we got this decade old structure, which we spend a lot of time feeding. Is that why? What, why do we have that in place? And, and because that kind of questioning starts to say, well, it's in place because a bunch of people 30 years ago thought it was a good idea. Right on. Boom, you're already into an innovation. And so that's a really powerful takeaway for us all, I think, um, regardless of how deep we want to get in, how close we want to get to that being, um, uh, you know, a dramatic shift, but this idea of asking more why questions and less how, that's a really practical thing that each of us can take away. And I see, as again, I see some, some chairs on boards uh, joining us today. That's a really powerful way for us to be opening ourselves up to new possibilities. I love that. I think that's excellent. Another thing that surfaced in one of our learning labs was they wanted to find different ways to in, engage in a very different way um, with their stakeholders. And what they're putting in place is their chair has five questions that whenever a big governance decision comes up, they're going to ask themselves these five questions. Mm -hmm. But aren't your typical questions, which is, um, you know, who do we need input from and should we use focus groups or surveys? Um, they step back much more from who is deeply affected by this decision, who might be able to significantly add value to the decision, and what kind of um, way could we incorporate them into decision making? And what would be the conditions that would allow that to take place? Those weren't the exact five questions. I'm just sort of giving you an example. But right. All thing, but enormously pivotal because it changes the kind of conversations that happen at the board table. It changes the way the dynamics of how they interact with their stakeholders. So it's, it's, it's not big and transformational, but over time, it could lead to some very different ways of doing things. I love that. And Linda, I think I just want to confirm those questions were around the process for us to make the decision. Is that a good way to describe them? Like I want well, to... Is that, who to that, engage, why yeah. would engagement, what value they might bring to, to that engagement. Yeah. But doing it not as a big engagement strategy plan, but rather as these things emerge around the boardroom table, asking it at that point becomes more dynamic, becomes more present. Um, it's like a gut check, right? It's yes. Like rather than yes. a set process, it's like, let's have right. this check, you know, as we're, as we're making this decision. Yeah. yeah. 
Brilliant. Uh, we got four minutes left. So fast and furious uh, response on this one. What is the one thing that you want us to take away um, as leaders in our organizations around how we should be reimagining our governance in 2022? What's the one big takeaway you'd like us to be, or question or idea you'd like us to be noodling about as we head into our leadership around board tables? Um, I would go back to what I said, you know, I think when it comes to governance, it's like this big thing, even like equity, big thing. And we often get stuck in the, but how can I change the system? And I am just one individual and there's all these barriers. And as I said, uh, you know, just drawing attention back to Cindy's work. Um, we, we actually have all the power of, of doing that in how our interactions uh, unfold. And as leaders in the sector, the interactions that take place have um, enormous ripple effect. And so if everybody were a little bit more intentional, a little bit more conscious, a little bit more curious and brave about how our interactions might be microsites of the very power dynamics we're talking about in governance mm. and equity. Uh, it becomes a little bit less daunting, I think, to imagine new ways of being with each other. Nice. And this isn't exactly answering your question, Kurt, but I'm in communication, so I'm, I'm gonna give an answer that I wanted to give. Permission granted, that's right. <laughs> but um, we, we've really been focusing on what not-for-profits need to do, the organizations, their board, the EDs. But as we know, that sits in an ecosystem. So we're also, as part of reimagining governance, going to be having conversations with, let's call them the gatekeepers, the capacity builders, the funders, the foundations, um, and, and, and creating some communities of practice with them because part of this is what ha can happen in a not-for-profit organization, but another part of what has to happen is they need, uh, funders need to be asking different questions. Um, and until we can start to shift that, then we're, we, we may remain fairly stuck over here. So we're working on these Brilliant. two. Uh, strategies simultaneously. Which comes back to that ecosystem concept that uh, our, our organization is operating in this bigger thing called the not-for-profit sector, which is then operating in this bigger thing we call the province of Ontario or the government of, or the country of Canada or global, love it, love it, love it, love it. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. How about a round of applause for Linda and Aaron and their insights, lots of big picture thinking for us today. Lots of really creative and uh, challenging in the healthiest sense ideas. So Linda and Aaron, thank you so much for sharing your time today. You can learn more about their good work at theonn.ca and follow that link and we'll add it to our follow-up next week if you want to sign up for the newsletters and hear more about the good work they do. That is the official end of Conversations That Matter, version one. We want to thank you all very, very much for being a part of this. We'll follow up next week with links to our videos, uh, gather some input on what you liked and what you didn't like. And you know what? You're going to see us again. We've had so many great conversations here. I think we need to continue them. So on behalf of Kim from PIN and myself from forceofawards.ca, thank you everyone for your time and your insights. Have a great day and enjoy the long family weekend. Hope you can find some time with your family. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Thanks, Aaron.